live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Of the tens of thousands of people who have ever played quarterback before across the United States and even the world, all of them at some point in time have dreamed about playing and starting in the National Football League. Only 32 men can start under center on any given Sunday in the NFL, and back in 1972, that number was even smaller, as it was at 26. Very few people get that opportunity to command a team, which is why it's always a feel-good story when a quarterback who was never expecting to dress, let alone start, comes out of nowhere and leads his team to a victory after waiting for his opportunity for so many years. Picture this. A quarterback gets drafted in 1966 and never gets to play. For the first six years of his career, he is either riding the pine and waiting for his opportunity or is serving in the military, with his football career completely on the back burner. Then out of nowhere in 1972, whereas he was expected to be the third or fourth string quarterback, he winds up climbing the depth chart and starting opening day, facing arguably the best defense in the entire league and he has the game of his life, and the game that he always dreamt of having. Well, that's exactly what happened with St. Louis Cardinals quarterback Tim Van Galder. And this is the story behind that. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand just who Tim Van Galder is, why he was not playing at first, and how he climbed up the depth chart to take the country by storm completely out of nowhere. Our story begins in the mid-1960s at Iowa State, where during the mid-60s, the Cyclones were led by Van Galder. Just to give you an idea of how tough Van Galder was, in 1965, he started for Iowa State in their game against New Mexico. The Cyclones lost the game, but that's beside the point. Van Galder threw for 254 yards just five hours after attending his father's funeral, having one of the best games ever from a yardage standpoint. Imagine being able to put on a performance like that so quickly after your father died. That's just the kind of player that Van Galder was. And he was an incredible quarterback for the Cyclones. Obviously, on the surface, the numbers don't look all that impressive as in his final two seasons with the team, he threw 12 touchdowns and 30 interceptions. However, with the appropriate context at the time, he was a really solid player. He led the Big 8 in completions in 1965 and 1966, becoming the first and only quarterback in Iowa State history to lead the conference in this category multiple times. He finished second in the conference in completion percentage in 1965 and 1966, and led the conference in passing yards during both of these seasons, once again, becoming the first and only quarterback in Iowa State history to lead the conference in this category multiple times. At the time, he was also just the second quarterback in Big 8 history to lead the conference multiple times, with the other one being Gail Weiner of Colorado. And in 1965 and 1966, he led the Big 8 in passing touchdowns. You name a passing category in the mid-60s, and there was a really good chance that Van Galder was atop the conference in it. As Van Galder said on the offense, after an awful 1964 season where he didn't throw a touchdown pass, and where the entire offense was a poor fit for his skill set, since all Iowa State did was roll out or sprint out, once the offense changed to be more pass-friendly in 1965, the rest was history. And the St. Louis Cardinals were impressed by his play, and drafted him in the sixth round. It seemed like Van Galder was about to live out his dream of playing professional football, and might even get a chance to start. Unfortunately for him, it didn't quite work out that way. Van Galder was a great player at Iowa State, and his success in football combined with his success in baseball, where he even threw a no-hitter once, made him a member of the Iowa State Athletics Hall of Fame. Now, it was time for him to continue his sporting career in the professional context. The only problem? He wasn't getting any playing time. In 1967, he spent the whole season on the practice squad, as he was unable to overtake Jim Hart on the depth chart. As a side note, I did a video on the career of Hart, so if you want to learn more about him and his success in the NFL, then click the card in the upper right corner. And then came his momentary retirement from the NFL, as he had to serve for two years because he was a member of the Army's ROTC program. Van Galder spent two years away from the game, serving one year in Korea and one year in Oklahoma. After that, he returned to the Cardinals, hoping to get a chance to play, and hoping to show the Cardinals why they spent a top 100 pick on him all those years ago. Alas, that did not come. Once again, he spent the whole season on the practice squad, behind Jim Hart and Pete Bethard. Even worse, head coach Bob Hallway had no connection with Van Galder, as he was not a member of the staff that drafted him. And while the Cards faltered and stumbled to an abysmal 4-9-1 record that season, Van Galder rode the bench. If you want to learn more about the 1971 Cardinals, I did a video about an infamous game they played on Monday Night Football against the San Diego Chargers, which you can watch by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Van Galder was about to be 28 years old, and he had played a grand total of zero snaps. The good news for Van Galder was that during the offseason, this man right here, Pete Bethard, was traded to the Los Angeles Rams. The Rams wanted a backup quarterback, since their current option, Jerry Rome, was not adequate. 
Rome completed just 27% of his passes for the Rams when called into action during the 1971 season, and he hadn't won a game as a starter since 1966, throwing 6 touchdowns and 13 interceptions since then for an abysmal touchdown-to-interception ratio worse than 1-2. to two. Rome would never play another game in the NFL after that. Bathard would back up former league MVP Roman Gabriel and provide depth at that position, so that was good for Van Galder that he was gone. The bad news was that the Cardinals acquired this man right here, Gary Quazzo. Hallway was on the Vikings staff in 1970 when Quazzo was there, and in his two seasons in Minnesota, Quazzo went 16-5 as the starter. Van Galder was still going to be buried on the depth chart. At least, that's what everyone thought, but he was about to get the break he had been waiting for his entire career. It seemed like heading into the 1972 season, the battle for the starting quarterback spot in St. Louis was between Gary Quazzo and Jim Hart. Tim Van Galder was a complete afterthought, and rightfully so. Here was this 28-year-old player who had never played a snap in the NFL, had spent his entire career on the practice squad, and didn't seem to show much of anything. However, during the preseason, Quazzo and Hart struggled, and during one game against the Denver Broncos, with the cards trailing 13-0, Van Galder came off the bench, threw a touchdown pass to Jackie Smith on his first play, and led the Cardinals to a shocking come-from-behind victory, as they won it by a final score of 17-13. And after the game, it finally seemed like the tide was turning in his favor. Hallway was impressed, saying that Van Galder gave the team a ton of momentum, and that the victory would not have been possible without him. And Van Galder, who made the most of this opportunity, made sure to let the press know about it. He said afterwards, You can't beat this life. I love football. I've waited so long that I didn't have a chance anymore being nervous. I've got the best attitude. I'm straight arrow. Clean lemons pay it off. I've waited long enough, but I haven't been sleeping. Maybe this will be old Timmy's year. Sure enough, after some more solid performances in the preseason, Van Galder, to the shock of a lot of people, was named the starting quarterback. His first assignment as the opening day starter? Take on the Baltimore Colts. Already, regardless of the opponent, this was going to be a tall order for Van Galder to handle. Now, taking on the Colts? Good luck with that. Baltimore's defense was arguably the best in the league. In 1971, the Colts allowed 140 points, which was the best total in the AFC, and only one point shy of the Minnesota Vikings for the fewest points allowed in the NFL. Baltimore allowed a mere 10 points per game, and allowed the second fewest passing yards and the fewest passing touchdowns in the league, while recording the second most interceptions. This was the team that Van Galler was going to be facing to kick things off in 1972. He waited years for his opportunity, and now was about to face a gauntlet of a defense. Sure enough, the 28-year-old rookie delivered, and then some. September 17, 1972. We're at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore for this interconference matchup between the Cardinals and the Colts, with the big storyline entering this game being that a 28-year-old who had never played before was going to be starting against a defense and a team that, on paper, was one of the best in all of football. And Van Galder himself was even a bit starstruck and awed all of this. He later said that the first start was overwhelming because he grew up watching Johnny Unitas, and now he couldn't believe that he was starting against him. As Van Galder said, in the first quarter, I'm standing next to one of my teammates, and I said, You know who's playing out there? It's number 19. It's Johnny U. I was like a little kid. It was just so neat. And not only did Van Galder play Johnny Unitas, but he beat Johnny Unitas. In a result that no one saw coming, in a result that sent shockwaves throughout the league, and in a result that eliminated just about everyone from their eliminator pools if you were playing that in 1972, the Cardinals beat the Colts 10-3. Van Galder finished the game going 10 for 15 with 110 yards passing, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 88.2. For some perspective on how good that was, in 1971, the average completion percentage was a hair below 51%, and the average passer rating was 62.2. Van Galder blew both of those numbers out of the water in his first start against the best pass defensive football from the year before. To put those numbers into an even greater context, Here's a chart showing every quarterback to throw at least five passes against the Colts during the 1971 regular season. There's a lot of really good quarterbacks on the list that the Colts held in check, including some future Hall of Famers like Bob Greasy, Fran Tarkenton, and George Blanda. Tim Van Galder had a higher passer rating in his first start against this defense than every single quarterback did in 1971 going up against Baltimore. It was an absolutely shocking performance. In the span of one day, Tim Van Galder went from an unknown player waiting for his opportunity to a star. Unfortunately for him, he would not be able to keep that momentum going. As it turns out, that one game against the Colts was a fluke, as any highlights from that point on were few and far between. He got the start of the next game against Washington, and in a 24-10 loss, threw no touchdowns and two interceptions. Van Galder started four games for the Cardinals after opening day, and the Cardinals did not win a single one of them. Over those games, Van Galder struggled heavily and was one of the worst quarterbacks in football. 
throwing one touchdown and seven interceptions while completing just 46% of his passes, taking eight sacks, and finishing with a passer rating of 27.9, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. He had a passer rating below 39.6 in every single start as well. Eventually, Van Galder got placed back on the practice squad and was let go after the 1972 season ended. He admitted that the Cards wanted to keep him on as the backup to Jim Hart, but he thought he could start elsewhere, and said that his exit from the Cards was his own fault. As he said, I didn't say the right things. They were deciding to keep me as a backup, and I didn't give them what they wanted to hear. I wasn't smart enough. Van Galder bounced around a few teams in 1973, signing with the Cincinnati Bengals and the New York Jets, but never suited up for either side, and he was out of the league by the end of the 1973 season. Still, even if that one game was a bit of a fluke, for one day, Tim Van Galder got to live out his dream. He was a 28-year-old bona fide rookie who had never suited up before and looked like he was never going to get his chance to truly play in the NFL. Then, out of nowhere, he gets the start against the league's best pass defense from the year before and against his childhood idol and winds up winning against all odds. When Van Galder said after that one preseason game against the Broncos, you can't beat this life, I love football, little did he know that on that opening day in 1972, his life was about to get a whole lot better in one of the most surprising starts in the over century-long history of the Cardinals franchise. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.